Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Hubert. Thank you so much for joining us today. It has been too long. And happy Tuesday, or in some cases, I see Wednesday. We really appreciate you being here. You know, I think most of you know, or I'm assuming you know, that APQC has been researching and working and collaborating and learning in the field of knowledge management for almost three decades now. It's hard to believe. But as part of that, content management has always been part of that um, agenda. And we've looked at it and focused on it, but it really wasn't until the last 10 years that APQC began to see things in our research. And one of those things was how people were approaching um, building the capability called content management, explicit knowledge otherwise, and um, capturing that and helping it move across the organization. And we realized they were following one of APQC's guiding principles and they were focused on the process flow of content. And that gave us new purpose and new excitement along the way, because you see, if one thing, it's one thing APQC knows and that is content. So I'm joined by my colleague today, Darcy Lemon. Hello everyone. And um, we're very excited to be here. Darcy and I have been longtime colleagues and KM Partners in Crime, a member just told <laughs> us that, and we, we wear that banner very proudly. And um, we just felt like it was about time to have this conversation. So we're, again, we're very excited you're here. And our agenda is really simple because you see in the last, of that last 10 years of focus, it's really been in the last six years that we've taken an even deeper look at what was going on. She and I have been doing some training and some strategic work and governance work in content management as part of our knowledge management efforts. And we keep learning from each other. And then the shoe dropped about four years ago and our CEO decided that it was time that APQC bring in really good practices, learning from our own resource library and bring and as well as our membership and bring those internally to APQC because we were like you sitting on a mound of, of content and information and it needed some organization. And Darcy and I realized that is when the rubber hit the road and we began reaching out to you all to our friends that we were seeing doing some really cool things and not leading with the big bang approach and just installing cool technology but to take a little bit more of a pragmatic um, method approach focused on process and people and letting the technology come in as you learned what your requirements were. So we started calling you all and saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing in that way? Oh, you're actually getting your business stakeholders to be part of this effort? How are you doing that? And so we felt like it was really time that we came in and shared with you what we were learning. And in turn, we hope that you will spend some time and give us some input back in because it's a constant learning cycle along the way. So a little stage setting. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly that, Cindy. Cindy. Um, and, 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 you know, as, as I'm looking, looking at this slide, I'm thinking probably the majority of the people who joined us uh, live here on this session, you know, they're thinking, gosh, Cindy Darcy, we know this stuff. We, we, we experience uh, we're, these things. We're, we're part of these statistics that are on this uh, on the screen right now. Um, and, and you probably are, just like APQC is, right? We're not immune to, to any of this. Um, and, you know, what's interesting, as Cindy mentioned, we've been... Um, on this knowledge management journey for so many years. Um, and then a, a, a few years ago, we started really looking at content management um, as, part of, as part of knowledge management, but taking a more focused um, look through our research. And Can everyone still hear me? Hello? Hello? 
Okay, I'm not hearing Darcy. Thaline, can you help us with any sound? Good, everybody can hear me. Okay, okay. I, was I was having, having a technical, technical issue. issue. I think it's fixed. It's a little bit echoey. I, I, hmm. echo. We may send someone up to help you. Okay, okay. All, right. all right. Should, Should I, I continue? continue? Are we good to go, guys? Yeah, we'll get it fixed with. Okay. okay. So I apologize. We'll, we'll get some technical support up here because I've done what I can with my settings, settings and it's beyond my <laughs> beyond my capabilities. <laughs> uh, so so um, why? One of the things that we realized is that the the issues that you see represented on the screen here today they seem to um, they seem to be escalating, and we seem to be hearing about them more and more. I mean, yes, they're perennial, but but the pain from them seems to be just getting worse. And um, we, we kind of have uh, encapsulated them, um, looked at it through three lenses, right, um, as in terms of drivers for this. One is the increased digitization, right, meaning more data, more content is being created in a wider variety of formats from your standard text files to, to video. And because of the increased um, number of technology platforms and the increased use of things like Zoom or Teams or what have you, we now have even more places to store all these wonderful files of, of, and, and um, pieces of content that we've been creating. Hey, Darcy. And, and, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm going to take over for a minute. We're going to get your technical difficulties fixed, and I'll okay. keep going and get you to join back in. We're just yes, a lot of background. So sorry, guys. You know, you rehearse and rehearse and planning is everything, right? So luckily, so let me pick back up on some of these issues that Darcy's talking about. Um, the, I think the bottom line is there's just, um, and the things that we see in all of this is that because of the digital, and I wanna pick up on that, um, I predicted this guys, and along with a lot of other people at APQC, we felt like um, digital was going to call new attention to how we were capturing and storing and collaborating around content and knowledge. And it did. And so I think we're in a really good place. As you can see, what it highlighted was just the inconsistency, the overload of data, the um, silos of data and information. And so a refocused effort along, it's almost like the perfect storm. As all of this was happening, people, we were really seeing some really good practices emerge and go forward. The other thing that happened, and I want to take you fast forward to now um, other things that people were focused on. APQC finished some research last year focused on productivity, both from a process perspective, and you can see that on, um, you can see that in terms of process strains, People were performing busy work, recreating processes and creating workarounds. And I sort of was smug and went, ah, these process people, do they know what they're doing? And then look at that knowledge data. So this really caused us to say, we have got to get very serious about what people are doing, how they're doing it, what focus areas they're taking so that we could really focus in on getting rid of some of these hours. Because guys, 8.2 hours is just too much time to spend looking for information or recreating information. And even if you half that for everyone and then half it again, that is still too much time being spent. And so that's where I think we've got to spend our focus is what's happening in our world and why is this why is this topic so important to us what's the avalanche happening and what kind of value can we get at it just at the cursory level and understanding it so knowing all of that there's a lot of things other than darcy's and my own internal journey with apqc saying oh my gosh we got to do this because our ceo wants this to happen and it is a journey I'll, we're going to be talking about it um i'd like to know and get a little bit from you guys on where you are in your own content management efforts. Now remember, APQC looks at content management as a capability under our knowledge management umbrella, right? So we look at it as a very important one, but that's it. So some, you guys give me, uh, Thaline, can you open the poll for me? And I'd like to hear from you all. Um, have you started your efforts or not? Um, are you building some strategy or doing some planning around it? 
Have you implemented it? Maybe just in a small area. We hear a lot of our uh, members, that's one approach is to eat the elephant one bite at a time and to start with some focus areas, get learnings, collect new technology requirements if that's needed, use the technology stack you have, and then begin to scale to that enterprise wide. And we have got some phenomenal cases and people who do that. Oh, and I love it, Daniel, we need to add an ad hoc. So that can be, um, yeah, thank you for putting that in the chat. So they win, um, let's, let's give everybody 15 more seconds and then open it up, yeah. Can we see the results for this? Ah, look at you guys. I'm, in, I'm impressed. So there's 12% of you that are enterprise wide. Thank you. You're going to be one we point to. And I'm very interested in hearing those of you who are implementing in a few of the business areas because that's, that's, that's commendable. And for those of you building a strategy, um, lots of things to talk about there because we've got a lot of ideas and what we're looking for. And for those of you who haven't started, I understand your pain. And I'm gonna tell you what, sometimes you have to restart. So those who have started have to go back to the beginning because they do some things that just aren't sound principles and you have to work on that. So with that said, thank you. That tells me a little bit. And um, we're gonna let Darcy, before we move on, test her audio. Darcy, you with us? I am. Do I sound any better? Oh, you guys give me a thumbs up. She does to me. So let me know if she does not. Ah, you got resounding yes. All right. So here we go. Good. Because remember, she's my partner in crime. I, I really can't do this without her at all. So look, I thought I said to Darcy, I said, oh, my gosh, we know all this stuff. We got best practices. We got all these learnings. How do we structure it? So we structured it using an after action review. What should have happened? what really happened, what caused it to happen, and what can we do about it? Because we'd like to leave you with some of our learnings. And guys, this really is a conversation. So please, please, please interact. So Darcy's going to start us off and we're going to start. Oh, I'm going to start us off. Take it back. I'm going to start you off. Let me give you some context because we wanted to ground you in best practices. And again, we have even more research coming forward to support this, but these have not changed, believe it or not, over time from our very early research, um, starting in content management, they've stayed pretty true to form, Darcy, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. So look, the first one is without a doubt, for those of you building a strategy, it's important that you're doing that. You've got to be able as part of that strategy to position content as a strategic element. I'm going to give you some headliners on all of these. You've got to tie it to the business goals. You know that. And you have to really understand your governance because you have to begin thinking about how content flows across the organization, just as a part, subset of knowledge, how does content flow and understanding who owns those systems. So scope and focus is very important. You can do a lot above the flow. Remember, if you're above the flow of work, you can move a lot faster, but eventually you have to look at how people work. And that's all part of your strategy and connecting people to content that they trust and that's valuable. That becomes part of the second one, create the content people want. We opened a hornet's nest when we started talking about this because it wasn't just about your content strategy aligned to stakeholder needs. It was also about how you delivered it to them and then what they did with it afterwards. Did they create variations and do you have enough um, governance and clamp downs in place that they can't do all sorts of things and turn it into something that it's not. After all, we live in a, a day of security and privacy that we have to adhere to all of those rules. So again, there's specific roles and processes that support that whole creation process. And you better real, be really tied into what your stakeholders need and how it's going to be managed so that then your creators can get the content that people really need. The third one is managing the end-to-end -end life cycle. We're going to spend some time on this because we see that it's one element of your secret sauce and really looking at it from a process perspective, understanding the steps, not only you understanding the technical steps as a knowledge management or content management lead, but to also be able to have, the, have your audience who participates in those understand. 
Number four is ensuring content is findable when needed. <laughs> Spend a lot of time on that. But again, what actually allows that to happen? What's included in that is not just the seamlessness of search and single sign-on. Those are important, but it's also about having those um, taxonomies where you connect your data and your metadata together and not just having your IT partners do that, but doing that in collaboration with your stakeholders, which leads us to best practice number five. You've got to le leverage collaboration throughout the life cycle. So we're going to talk about it not only in the context of strategy development and getting really focused, but also what happens when you get in the middle of this and business priorities change or your content is not the quality that you thought it would be. How do you ensure that collaboration stays there and goes out throughout the life cycle? And that's where our knowledge management efforts come in to enable the content management capability. And then finally, we could not leave, of course, without managing change and measuring success. Again, ongoing training, ongoing communication, they're all part of that. But it's also about making sure you're measuring the right thing and driving back to the value of why you started there. If it's productivity, go back to that. And you have to be able, our CEO was real a stickler about this because we were, oh, everybody's disgruntled because they can't find things and oh they can't well you know her short answer is I don't care now she really does care but it's what is it going to do for the business because that's what's important for APQC what are how do we better serve our members how do we make things more seamless for our employees who are servicing our members and that became our real big objective driving towards that so those are our north stars that starts you out on what should have happened? So Darcy's going to get into our first few that talks about what should have happened uh -huh, and what did. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Cindy, for that great lead in. So let's um, let's see if my <coughs> technology is cooperating with me now. All right, Cindy, I'm going to need you to drive, apparently. <clears throat> but at least the audio is working. And that's the important part right now. <laughs> so as Cindy said, those best practices, those are what should have happened, right? And our first one, um, the develop a, <clears throat> develop a strategy to connect people to content. Um, our lesson has been really that content management is a business problem, not a technology problem. Now, that's not to say that technology doesn't have a role. You heard Cindy talking about that just a moment ago, and we're actually going to talk about it a little bit more in a few minutes. But what our experience has been both uh, with the clients that we've been working with, as well as internally here at APQC, is that, um, you know, while we'd all like to have, you know, the ultimate in technology and everything is really, there's a bigger business problem at hand here. That business problem has to do with things like, um, what is our content looking like? Understanding what that content is that our different um, uh, audiences, our different departments and uh, functional areas and the end users within them the content that they need to perform their work. It has to do with the roles and responsibilities with regard to that content. It has to do with the culture of the organization um, and so many other factors. And then there's technology, right? So our lesson learned has been that uh, you really, um, you know, over the years, a lot of times what we've encountered is that uh, organizations believe that uh, content management can be solved solely with a technology solution. And that's just, that's just not the case. Um, that there really is a, a, a huge business component to it that needs to be addressed um, uh, ahead of, or at least in parallel with uh, whatever technology solution may be being designed and, and or implemented at that point in time, right? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, having some other audio issues now. <laughs> uh, so part of that really then, um, part of that lesson um, uh, goes, that goes hand in hand with it is the need to partner with the business, right? You've got to partner with your stakeholders in the business to get input from them, to um, uh, understand what those needs are, to understand um, down to the tactical level of you know, what content um, does the, the, the target audience within our, within our organizations want to work with or need to work with. Um, and if you're doing this enterprise-wide, 
you have multiple target audiences that you're working with. So how do you figure that out, right? Create personas, um, uh, work with focus groups, um, you know, whatever it takes um, in your organization to collect that input. You can do this very formally through, um, as you see here on the screen, steering and advisory committees or some type of cross-functional oversight group. Um, whatever that uh, approach looks like in your organization, whatever's appropriate for your organization, you need to just do it. Um, sometimes, we'll talk about this in just a moment, sometimes that might seem like it's gonna slow you down. Um, and, and it could a little bit, but the end result will be a much stronger content management capability inside your organization. <clears throat> so, uh, Cindy, let's move, um, let's move forward. Oh, I can't, you're on, okay, there we go. So our second, um, our second should, what should have happened, you know, create a content that people want. Um, and again, based on our experience in this with clients and internally, um, our lesson has been that yes, it's important to understand the content that people want, but the second part of that is, and you can only move as fast um, as the business is willing to, to move with you. So if your business partners, whatever, um, um, operational or functional area that you might be working with in the organization, you know, they may not be ready to move in lockstep with you. Um, there may need to be a series of conversations in the form of meetings, um, you know, in person via Zoom or Teams or what have you to help them understand the value proposition, why they should be contributing time <clears throat> to this, how it's going to help them in the long run. But ultimately, what we want them to understand is that we need their input to know what this good content should look like, mm -hmm. to understand what is it that we should be focused on. Our organizations, all of our organizations, right, have whew, millions maybe of uh, files uh, uh, stored in, you know, stored in Teams, stored on shared drives, stored on OneDrives, stored in file cabinets, perhaps still. I, I know APQC still has a few of those. Uh, we'll be the first to admit it. <laughs> Uh, so how do we narrow that down, right? And uh, to what we should be focusing on and then how to help, how to help ensure that, that is, is, this is um, uh, what one of our clients likes to call high quality content. And you can see some of those criteria here on the screen, right? How do we ensure that it's relevant and helpful, that it reflects the user's needs, not just what we think, we as the KM practitioners, we as the um, people responsible for content management in our organizations, not just what we think makes it good, but what do they think makes for good content. So the relevant and the helpful, the trustworthy, where it's accurate, and up to date, and it's the best knowledge we have on the topic, the consistency, a similar look, feel, and style so that it's really easy to navigate um, through the different uh, pieces of content that I'm, I'm looking for so that I'm able to quickly find uh, what I need and it's in a reader-friendly format. It pops. Um, I'm not having to dig through, you know, a seven or 17 or 27 page file to find the one piece that I need that's buried somewhere on three quarters of the way down on page 15, right? Uh, so, you know, those conversations, um, uh, understanding what good looks like for our end users, understanding what their challenges are with regard to the content are all key inputs into uh, a strong content management capability. And Darcy, I'd just like to say one of the things, one of the members that Darcy and I are working right now, they said the best thing not long ago, talking about content creators. And I think there, I, I just assume because in my role at APQC, I've always been a content creator in many variety of ways. Our mm -hmm. research services did that. But we have a lot of people at APQC, our staff, that are consumers. They don't do a lot of, they take what's given to them and they do other things with it. They use it, they consume it, they provide it to our members. And so I think I, we were with a content creator for her organization and she said, yeah, we were talking about the whole process and making this happen. And she said, you just, you've got to have some joy in content creation. You have to really enjoy building that and getting excited about it and putting things together to create something new or improving a piece of content. And I think that's a really, I think that's a critical success factor for those of us who are creative. We don't realize that it. it's not, it, it almost has to be a deliberate thought saying, gosh, I'm really enjoying this to create. So I think that's an important thing, Darcy, as you start talking about the quality of content 
And absolutely. Yeah. And again, a great segue um, to our next screen. <laughs> because that is important, right? So we want to understand the, the criteria that our end users have um, in terms of that trust. We want trustworthy content. We want consistent con content that has a consistent look and feel. Um, you know, it needs to be relevant, it needs to be helpful, but we have to do things to enforce that quality. Once we know what that quality, what it, what it means to people, what it looks like to people. Um, so we, um, you know, we have to, as again, the people respond potentially responsible for content management in our organizations, um, going back to you know, understanding the audience um, and, and their needs and preferences. Um, and then once we know what that is, what are we going to do to create and enforce those content standards, right? What are some of the things that um, the practices, the processes we might need to put in place in terms of content reviews um, in order to ensure it stays up to date, uh, for example, or archiving out of date content to pull it out of the system so it doesn't show up when we search and, and clutter up our search results. Yeah. And even the train and train providing training and support to those content owners and the creators like Cindy Hubert here uh, to help them understand that everything from where to find the latest template that they should be using, you know, a Word doc template or a PowerPoint template, um, where to go to find those, um, any guidelines around the type of content that they're creating and um, uh, rules or guidelines about how to create it, when to create it, where to put it once it's created, whether or not it needs to be reviewed and um, perhaps um, uh, reviewed by a subject matter expert um, and approved by them before we publish it. All of these things go into ensuring good content quality. Cindy, did you have a comment? No, I think it's on our next our next lesson learned, Darcy. I'll, ah, I'll combine okay. it together. I'll leave them waiting. <laughs> yeah. So our next should um, is all about managing the end-to-end -end content life cycle. And our, our lesson learned is that um, quite often that's that's not what we're doing. Quite often uh, what, what we see happening is this kind of mishmash of what uh, we consider to be above the flow and in the flow content management activities. Um, and, and so what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the screen here, what you're seeing here is um, this is APQC's content management relationship map. And if you look um, at this top row up here where we've got um, develop and manage your content strategy. And what the activities or processes and activities represented there include develop the strategy, um, define and manage content governance, you know, develop and manage your taxonomies. And you can read the other two, compliance, for example, um, up there. Um, oftentimes we find that people are trying to manage all of that down here in the flow while they're actually creating that content or refining it or, or um, uh, uh, storing it, publishing and pushing it out to whoever the, the end users are. And there is a certain tactical level of that that happens down here. But if we don't think about it above the flow, if we don't take that step back, those of us who are responsible for content management in our organizations, take that step back and say, what are our objectives for content management? What, what is our strategy? What are we trying to accomplish? Who needs to be involved in this, both from an ownership perspective, as well as those content authors or creators, reviewers, approvers, um, uh, um, end users, everybody has a role to play at some level, at some point in, um, in content management. Um, and so it's important to um, make sure you've got these things crisply and clearly defined in your organization, that you have that strategy, you have the governance and the roles and responsibilities, you understand what compliance is going to look like um, and make sure that these things are communicated um, um, up down and across in your organization to those affected audiences. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying that, who's your target audience? We're gonna talk a little bit about understanding that target. We're gonna get a little bit more into that in just a moment um, yeah. uh, when I let Cindy take over the microphone again. Um, well, let me, I'm gonna tell them you my- You wanna jump aha. in now? Yeah, okay. I've got my aha moments here and I think it'll set up your next slides and, and go back to the quality. So guys, I, I don't think these are just mind boggling, but they were two things that struck me over these past couple of years as I've, I've learned more and more about this. So number one, look at that on the outside called business processes, right? Because there's a lot of business processes where people get their jobs done and they don't necessarily think about the content quote being created, 
reviewed, stored. Some do, some do it naturally. We see that happen a lot with our financial management processes, human resources. We see some things happening with that. But it gets, when you start talking about the business process and then watching your content go through, your explicit knowledge go through that business process, sometimes it gets really, really muddy. And for me, that was a real important, I think, point where you have to really understand that integration of your content management processes, those ones that Darcy are describing there, with your business process. It should all flow seamlessly. They shouldn't have to think about it. But when you're just doing this, for instance, in a um, sales function, when you are creating proposals, writing contracts, you're just doing that as a natural part of your cycle, but it may not be organized well. And so all the content management, good processes and rules and principles have to be applied there. That was number one, that integration. Number two was, is when you get down to the use of the content. So we're working with a lot of members who provide content to an end user or to, you know, to, to someone. And where they lose control is when that end user then has a separate system, they store it locally. So they're not following They're In other words, they're providing this service, they give content, and the end user is not subscribing to the same content management discipline and rules that you have set up. And so you can get a proliferation and variations of the same content so that while you may be maintaining that trusted content, that one version of the truth, you've got 30 other field offices out there who have at least 50 variations of the same piece of content. And that's just, you know what, it's problematic. I don't know that I have a great solution to it other than you got to use good change management tactics to get people you're supplying content to to help also manage it in their systems. Mm -hmm. So those are just two lessons that came out of this that I was not expecting to learn. Thanks. Darcy. Thank you, Cindy. You know, I think it, I think it comes down to also um, another aspect uh, that we haven't really included here, uh, but is understanding, you know, which, what content do we need to tightly manage because yeah. it is super critical and there's, it could put us at risk if, um, if we don't manage it, if it got out in the world, if um, somebody started editing the middle, uh, you know, think of, think of um, the, the, well, Cindy mentioned it earlier, secret sauce, which made me think of, I think it was McDonald's and the, the secret sauce for their, um, for one of their hamburgers uh, years and years ago. Well, just think about if somebody had started randomly editing the formula for their secret sauce, right? It wouldn't have, um, uh, it would have done them a lot of harm. And that's a very simple example, I realize. But understanding what, what content um, uh, do we need to manage for? We need to have access controls and version controls and storage controls. And maybe there's a life cycle to that piece of content um, uh, versus other content that, you know what? We don't necessarily like the fact that people are storing local copies of it, but it's not gonna do maybe, as it, it, there's not as high of a risk associated with that. Yes, it could get outdated, but it's not going to cost us revenue or something like that um, if that information were to become outdated because they're using a local copy. So there's some decisions that have to be made um, as you're, um, as you're uh, developing your strategy and your governance and all of that. There are decisions about what do we need to control and, and, and what, can we, what can we maybe let go of a little bit um, uh, with regard to uh, the content that, and, and our target audiences. So, so back on topic here, um, the, uh, staying with the, the content life cycle, um, you know, we've identified um, several things that, that really help you um, ensure a strong, a strong life cycle, right? One being those roles and responsibilities for content ownership. Now here at APQC, we have a very strong process focus. We have, ha have had that process focus um, since Jack Grayson, our, our uh, late founder, uh, started the organization 40 plus, 40 plus years ago. And um, our process owners also have content ownership responsibilities. We said, if you're gonna be responsible for owning that process and ensuring that it's working the way it should be working, then you're also going to be responsible for the content that supports the execution or the performance um, of, that, um, of that process. Um, 
So you can see some of the other um, uh, components of a strong life cycle here. Um, and you know, a couple of things that we, um, I wanna say too, is that you, know, you need to understand um, what are the triggers uh, that happen um, in your business processes, going back to that, to the relationship map for a moment, what are the triggers that happen out in the business that, you know, something happens and it triggers the need for some new content? Is there a new product being developed and we're about to go to market on it and we have to get everybody trained up on the new product? Um, you know, is there, has there been, um, we've gone through a big process redesign and we have to train people on um, the new the new way the process works. We've got to update all of our process documentation uh, and, and our desk procedures, um, et cetera. So thinking through what are some of the key components of that content life cycle um, uh, can be, uh, is another uh, critical success factor for strong content management in our organizations. And I wanna stay with the whole roles and responsibilities for just a moment longer, bear with me here. Go, now Cindy back forward one more time um, because uh, what we've seen in the organizations that uh, we have, um, the, the ones that we reached out to and have benchmarked with, as Cindy was mentioning earlier, as, as well as the ones that uh, we have actually uh, worked directly with is, uh, you know, we've seen, we've seen this. We know what happens when there's a lack of content ownership, right? And you can see some of the things right here. And what we've encountered uh, very uh, frequently is that, um, First of all, that in, in a lot of organizations, what we've encountered is that the whole notion of maintaining our content through its life cycle from we create it, we refine it, we publish it, we use it, and then what, right? There's, a, there's like a hole that the content falls into. We publish it, we're assuming people are using it, but what about keeping it up to date? What about maintaining that content until it's no longer needed for whatever reason? Well, that review part, that maintenance part, oftentimes gets neglected. And one of the reasons it gets neglected is because we don't have clear ownership for it. The other thing that we've seen is that there's um, frequently a belief that, that, that maintenance of our content is everyone's business, you know, especially content that um, is used by multiple teams or, or departments across our organization. It's like, well, you know, everybody will keep an eye on it and, and, They'll let somebody know when we need to update it. Well, you know, come on. We all know if it's everybody's responsibility, it's really nobody's responsibility. So we need, um, we, we, we strongly emphasize um, uh, having that, identifying that content ownership, um, making sure that person or, or persons, it may be more than one, um, know that they are owners of that content and what comes with that content ownership. What are the responsibilities and expectations um, that come with that? So finally, one more thing um, with regard to uh, our, our maintaining content and the content life cycle, um, and that is the need to really um, uh, monitor and enforce the standards. If we, as the people responsible for content management, knowledge management in our organizations, if, if we're not helping the business, our business partners define what these standards are, um, we need to do that. Um, we prefer that we do it um, in relationship or in partnership with those, um, those business stakeholders um, and, and then help them understand why it's important. Because a lot of times they'll look at this and they see it as, as administrative, which it is to a certain extent. They see it as trivial, uh, which it is not, uh, because this is what helps us keep that content up to date. It helps us ensure that there is a review process, um, that those reviews are being performed. Um, that if there is an issue with non-compliance, we have a way of uh, running that up the flagpole, so to speak, um, and, and getting that addressed. Uh, we have a mechanism by which to identify content to be archived and then a process for archiving it. Um, and then as much as possible, we can automate these workflows. Uh, may not be able to do all of it right away in terms of the automation, but let's take advantage of what technology we do have in-house, whether your Office 365 or Google Suite or whatever you may be, take advantage of the features um, that it offers um, um, to at least get some automation in there. And then if you do bring in like a dedicated content management uh, solution, um, certainly automation uh, should, be, should be part of that. So um, all of this to say that we can't, and, we, and we're, doing, we're doing all of this and we still can't lose, um, lose track of the fact that um, 
we need to know where the end user comes into play with this. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Cindy to talk about the next few best practices and lessons learned. Thank you, Darcy. You know, just one more note on this, guys. It, when you look at this on paper, when you, you go, oh my God, that's so much work. We got to hire all these content managers. Some organizations have, they'll hire a small group to help do some of these things. We so APQC chose to go the process route because we're real steeped in processes. We're small and we serve a large membership, you guys. But at the same time, you know, you may have just one or two people doing the same thing. So embedding the content and the knowledge needed as part of this and then doing these um, checkpoints gets picked up as part of our just natural process flows. It's just built into the expectations of the job that people take on. And um, it's not a full-time role. It's a small percentage, depending on how you set it up. So while it looks to be a lot, once you get your arms around it and then start really linking it to how people are working, it, it doesn't seem to be as overwhelming as it does at first glance. But we'll, we'll let you respond to that. <laughs> it's big. Okay, so what should happen, right? Oh my gosh, you should be able to find content. Search needs to work all the time. We're all um, looking for Google on steroids. That's what should happen, right? Ensure content is findable when needed. And so it is true. Technology gives you that dream and inspiration. Very exciting, um, you know, to be able to put all these things in place and just have everything happen at your fingertips in the flow. It's simple. It anticipates what I need. We also then begin to incorporate the deep test at knowledge and the personalization. These are all things people want, right? And yes, technology can help you do that. But again, while you are keeping that user experience in place and you're understanding what their needs are, you've got to have some backing to all of these things. In the flow, Darcy just talked about it, having that process flow, um, making the user experience less confusing. That's about how have you structured your data and providing it in a very seamless format. That all supports that development. So one of our big lessons in this is you have to be willing to right size your content management efforts. So what do I mean by that? Well. You may not get to that end state where again, it all looks so simple and it just flows and everything's automated and artificial intelligence is there. You may have to take it piece by piece. And a lot of times what we have seen when you start with what Darcy has just described and get down the road, you're able to start making some improvements. It's not like you're just spending all your time in planning. You need to start doing um, you need to start learning and begin to do some interesting things to understand what's happening in the flow of work. Those are demonstrations, pilots, whatever you want to call them. And yes, you have to remember there's more to seamlessness, con getting to content more than just search, right? There's the single sign-on, there's the links between applications. Um, we were just asking chat, how do you maintain all this and do it all when everything's very decentralized? That's where that above the flow governance comes into play because you get stakeholders who are doing this in various parts to at least subscribe to a little bit of a consistent governance. This is how we'll do things. These are the business rules we'll follow. And then you gotta let people you know, do what they wanna do. But again, I think that's important is that you may not be able to do this all at one time. And that's one of the hardest things to explain to your leadership. And my learning in all of this is they want to see, leadership tends to want to see something very tangible in this. It's not just, oh, productivity is going to be better. Great. What are you going to do with that extra time you have? Um, that's usually the first question. But it's the things that, you know, how will I know this is happening? How will I see it? And when you take that whole process focus, it's process change and it's hard to make, you know, to change how people are actually working. So I think this is where you just really have to balance and right size your efforts saying, we're gonna start out our journey as we go through this 
integration with our business processes and our workflows and understanding the functionality requirements, we are going to get better at understanding our requirements. And guys, I will tell you this, our mantra walking in is we really do advise organizations to work with the technology partners to say, let's get a few demonstrations, see how this looks and see if we're really on the right track with these requirements. So you don't go out and spend a lot of, of money on technology that may end up not serving your needs as you thought they would. One of the cases that we've seen in this, and we've had some great use cases for artificial intelligence. And again, um, I am so for this. Anything that you can make easier Absolutely. And so one of the things that where we've seen AI be very successful in content management efforts is, is with search, right? So using these modern search capabilities to allow you to filter, get just the things you need. The problem is no one does it. No one uses filter. Darcy was even admitting to me, she goes, you know, I don't, I go through a few tries and then I'll add a search filter or two. Yeah. This is true. Just yeah, this morning. Do. It, it just doesn't happen that way. And so again, it once you've got some of the hard blocking and tackling and really understanding these connections of your data and your content, then you begin can begin to factor in some of that eye and get it to automatically pop up for people. That means you've got that very close relationship. The mm -hmm. other thing we do and we see a lot of, and you always hear in content management, let's develop use cases, let's develop personas, let's do all these things. Great. Those are all good. And they, but they may not serve you well at the very beginning. They, Darcy and I, in our APQC zone efforts, we did personas very early on. It was very helpful in identifying targeted content we wanted to manage. Not as Darcy said, you may not want to manage everything. You may want to control it and apply some of the practices and rules, but it doesn't get that clamp down consistency of audit, audit and compliance all the time. So you may make some decisions and that may help you with those personas. So mm -hmm. it's not that they're not valuable. I just think that the timing has to be right to put those in place. And again, mm -hmm. once you do that and once you really understand it, you can really amp up and then become more anticipatory in terms of, hey, I'm a project manager. When I'm getting ready to kick off my efforts, these are all the tools and templates that I absolutely need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I think, again, one of the things taxonomy has done for us in terms of, of um, helping surface those relationships between topics and keywords, the metadata that people always talk about. And guys, here's what, here's what Darcy and I learned as we started observing what was happening in members. They don't hand off their taxonomy for a third party to do or an IT partner to do. They're taking this on themselves. So content management, knowledge management is facilitating that process to help the business begin to understand their taxonomy and really think through the business rules. I mean, it, it's a necessary thing because they own the content, right? They own that content, they own the knowledge, and they've got to be the ones to be part of that. Darcy, didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to add, but had to go with AI because we know it's important to all of this. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought up the fact that, you know, th those end users, the, 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 the process people out there, they're the, they are, they're the ones that own, own the content. Um, so they, they do need to be a part of the conversation throughout your content management efforts throughout that, um, throughout that life cycle. Okay. And y'all, we had just this morning, speaking of right sizing, we were involved in a conversation where some right sizing took place. Uh, we're, we're working with um, a client and uh, they, we've been helping them develop an enterprise wide content management. That was the charter that this team was, was um, handed by their senior leadership team last year. Um, and in recent months, there's been a lot of conversation around a particular body of content and how critical it is um, uh, to this organization's, uh, let's, they, they deliver content to um, a third party that relies heavily on a particular body of content. So the, the word came down this morning that uh, we are scaling back our efforts, at least momentarily, um, uh, from enterprise-wide to focus on this one particular 
super critical body of content. Um, uh, there's a lot of different reasons for that that I, I can't go into um, uh, uh, online like this, um, but just say that, uh, and they shared those, those reasons with us, um, but it was a, we, we lived through a right-sizing moment <laughs> in a conversation that yeah. we had first thing this morning. So uh, just, you know, be prepared um, and, and, and just be, you know, you have to flex when that happens. Absolutely. You got to mirror the advice of your business. And mm -hmm. That's what's going on with the business. Mm -hmm. So let me go into collaboration. So we let right this we just think happens. It should happen. Leverage collaboration. Everybody should collaborate because content gets better when people consume it, give feedback, share it, experts step in. It always does. And so we think it happens, but there's a lot of challenges that go about, right? You have multiple teams in different locations. They're not totally aligned on the same thing. You have silos where duplicate work is being gone, going on. Also duplicate content being created. Critical knowledge walks out every day. We lose it. We build on it. We forget what is one source of the truth because of our data efforts are not connected with that. We don't have experts engaged in really perfecting and making that content. And of course, just the overall absorptive capacity. So our big aha in this, okay, so what do you got to do about it in learning? You've got to really orchestrate your collaboration, right? And it's not serendipitously. So we think you can start out in a very pragmatic way. That's what all of this is about in that you can start with a core team that is very focused on providing the services the products, the, the things, the templates, the tools to help ma manage content, manage a body of content. That usually comes from a core team in partnership with others, IT, HR, learning, organizational development. Your leadership has to be in very involved in this. As Darcy was just giving you an example, when leadership says business has got to turn because we have these priorities coming up, you better be ready to do that. And that's where I think your above the flow models and governance help you so much because you can turn on a dime because those tend to stay pretty consistent and you can change the business processes. And then your most important group in all of this, I think is um, your, your business stakeholders. And sometimes that's a little bit harder to get them seated as being part of collaboration. They just wanna consume, they're, you know, they, they just wanna use the content that they have and apply it. And so having them get into those cycles of feedback. Um, one of the questions earlier in our Q and A was, what, how do you, where does your feedback loop go in your relationship model? Ours goes back to quote, a content strategy, which could include planning what new content is needed, expanding, enhancing content. We get it from the get-go, but feedback is really needed throughout the entire uh, process life cycle. And then finally, and I wanna make sure, cause we wanna take a few questions. I know we've had a few, what should happen, right? Now this one's a wild card. The whole, it, you should be able to manage change and measure success, right? But I think a lot of time um, change management feels like climbing up this staircase. And if you notice, there's even mold on the tiles on the side. It feels kind of moldy and old. And I've been there before and it feels like drudgery. So I think obviously as you get into managing change, all the skills you can bring in, if you've got change agents to help you work through the whole process life cycle, the advocates as for the business and all of this, it's great. Empathy, communication, understanding, um, really keying into what the vision looks like on how we're going to help you get there. And this is a journey can come along with also making sure that you have the right processes in place and, P and engagement activities that keep, get people involved and keep them involved in those processes. So I think there's that anticipation that you always have to look at to sustain change. And again, what we've seen is that repeatable model where yes, the big picture is enterprise content management, but we're going to do it and keep everything in concert, a body of content at a time. And a lot of our members have gone where um, the business leaders have wanted them there. They've said, I wanna do this first. And they've gotten some great demonstration in all of that. What also ties into that is the whole measurement scheme of what people are doing. And I think you have to look, this gives you a, a we have a, some great content pieces 
in our resource library for you that really lays out all the types of activity measures all the way from adoption that you might need, the business impact and how you align them through some value logistics or um, logic along the way. And then of course, always getting that feedback back as part of your closed loop process in your content management life cycle is very important. Darcy, anything you wanna talk about with change? It's a big- I think you've hit, you've hit the high point, Cindy. Yeah. We could, do, we, could do, we could do a whole series of these webinars on nothing but change. You know that. Your, your lessons are probably profound, but let's get a little bit more from you guys. I know we're getting close to our um, sign-off point, but we won't let the conversation stop. What is your current challenge for content management? When you look at these, what should happen, where do you find your biggest challenge? That's what Darcy and I want to know. Um, I, I used to think that it was more about developing the strategy. I've sort of it landed on for me. Well, let me not tell you. I'll tell you where what I still think the biggest challenge is. I don't want to, I don't want to sway your responses. We have a couple of questions. Let me look at that. Um, Beto, thank you. You're the one who asked about the with the three C's of responsibility. Um, if it's decentralized, how do you keep it all together? And my response to him was what I just shared with you all. I think that above the flow governance is one of the things that you have to ask people to be a part of, to subscribe to at a very high level. I'm not getting down into the weeds of how it works, but really to under, help them understand that the, of why those things are needed, why it has to be part of the strategy, and then how, you know, you're either being... Um, helping solve the problem or you're part of the problem. And variations of content are part of the problem, right? <laughs> they, they don't work all the time. So Thalen, let's look at our, our final and Darcy and I will do a wrap up. All right, aha, so ensuring content is findable, okay. That's a big one, guys. And again, you heard our, our lesson to that. You may have to right size so you can build in those processes and that whole life cycle. And I agree with you, levering collaboration is huge. And that just takes some deliberateness in terms of getting people on board. Very good. Thank you. So Darcy, I'm gonna let, I'll, I'll build out the first three and let you, we wanted to summarize just our lessons yeah. for you. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So remember, um, as we as we when we started the um, started our discussion with you all today, this really what we're what what we've been experiencing. What we see is that it is a business problem, and it, not a technology. And again, not that technology is not a part of it, but there's a bigger issue in the business that we oftentimes don't address. And and because we don't address it, that's why we end up with technology problems because we haven't. You know, we haven't taken the time to to understand the content needs, to understand the requirements for taxonomy, metadata, et cetera. And it creates the tech, the, the technology problem and mess that we that we sometimes find ourselves in. Um, we have to we have to work at a pace that our business partners are willing to support. We can't go faster than they are than than, than they're willing to to move. Um, we've seen that happen so many times. The KM team is ready. We've, we've designed, we're ready to launch. And the business is like, time out, wait a minute. We got business stuff over here to do. So we need to do this business stuff. And then we'll come back and, 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 and work with you all. It's like, okay, we can't do it without y'all. Um, and then um, talking about you know, the, the content management life cycle and the, um, the, the, the relationship um, of the content management processes to each other, the content management, pro the relationship between the content management processes and the business processes, and then really that above the flow look um, um, at the, our content management and business processes to understand what is the strategy, what is the governance that we need, what kind of um, standards and, uh, do we need to put in place, how are we going to monitor, who's going to be responsible for doing all of this. Uh, all, all key things that we need to keep in mind as we're designing our content management efforts inside our own organizations. Thank you, Darcy. 
And of course, guys, uh, right sizing, I think, is so important. You can still do enterprise content management, but do it in a phased agile approach and you're going to get really further. The orchestrating collaboration, as I said earlier, if you can show people how content gets better when they actually have a conversation around it, it really works. And then, of course, I think our um, a past president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, said plans are worthless because planning is everything. Be prepared for the curveball because it absolutely happens. If there are any further questions, we will be happy to answer those offline as we need to um, and, and work on those. Just a reminder of some things coming forward. We have APQC's um, 2023 conference, April 17th through 21st in Houston. Please go to our website to learn more, as well as joining us with roundtables that are on the calendar. And of course, our monthly webinar. Thank you so much. Somebody said earlier, it's been too long and I agree. It's been quite a while and we're, we're glad to get back in the habit of getting together with you guys monthly. And then with that said, everyone, please, um, you will be getting the slides, a copy of those, and um, you can visit apqc.org for more events. Please take our webinar satisfaction survey when the webinar closes. We only get better when you give us feedback. And stay connected. Darcy and I may be reaching out to you because we do constant benchmarking on this topic called content management. There's a lot more to come. Thank Absolutely. you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day.